Hi everyone, hopefully you can see me and my co-presenters and the screen that I'm presenting at the moment. Uh, thanks a lot for coming along today. Um, we are going to be talking about an introduction to patent searching. Uh, this is the first of a series of webinars we'll be doing over the coming months. Uh, hopefully giving you some extra education and tools uh, for you to work um, with uh, and to give you a better understanding of IP and how you can you can use that within your business uh, to enable you to make better business decisions. In the case of this first webinar, we thought it would be a good place to start with patent searching. Um, it is something that's uh, difficult to do. It's quite enigmatic. Um, it, it's quite opaque. Uh, I've done lots of searching myself in the past um, in a previous role to the one that I'm in at the moment. And I know firsthand that um, there's a way to do it right and a way to do it wrong. Um, and, and so today we're just hopefully going to give you a few tools to show you how to do it right. Um, we've got myself, so I'm a senior associate with Martin Clark, for those of you that don't know me. I work in the mechanical fields, uh, electronics and software. And then we've got Dan, who's an associate, uh, who's more of a chemist, but does do quite a bit of mechanical work. Um, and we've got Jack, who's a patent analyst, who's um, basically going to do a live search for us today. So we're, we're quite excited about that. Um, and that, that's where a lot of what we're going to tell you will sort of come into into effect and you'll be able to see a, a professional searcher going through the motions which um, which should uh, give us some good results so uh, on that note I'll let Dan and Jack just introduce themselves a little bit themselves and, and give a bit of background and then we'll, we'll dive in and, uh, and get going okay Dan do you want to go first? Hi afternoon everyone um, so yep uh, Dan Wilson home I am an associate here at Marks and Clark um, so I work across uh, two areas, so chemistry as well as mechanical inventions. Um, I've been with Marks and Clark for seven, maybe eight years now. Um, so I've got a fair bit of experience of searching and slightly more than your average attorney just because of the, the particular fields I'm working in at the moment. Hi, my name is Jack Hennessy. I'm a patent analyst here at Marks and Clark. I've been here for about uh, a year and a half. I work within the information services team uh, to support the, the fee earners and the business development officers. Um, my background is in mechanical engineering and that was my undergrad degree. So um, that's where my experience lies, but I venture into all of the uh, subject areas as well. Right, thanks, chaps, uh, and a big thank you to Jack today as well because he stood in at short notice. The uh, we've got a, a grandee searcher who uh, couldn't make it today at short notice, unfortunately. But um, yeah, so uh, thank you to Jack to, to step into the breach. Good stuff. Right, on that note, let's move on. Will that move on? So, what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, first and foremost, we'll, we'll be sort of tucking into what is patent searching. So. Um, there is a massive database of documents out there. What can you use it for? You can use it for the obvious things of um, searching for prior art for, for, a, for a patent, uh, for, for filing your own patent application, but there are a whole other number of uses you can, you can use that massive database for. Uh, so we're going to delve into that a little bit uh, and give you an oversight of the different types of searching um, and why you can use it and where you'd want to use it. Um, we're going to take a bit of a step back and look at a patent itself. So hopefully you all know what a patent is in terms of a legal right and what you can use it for. But we're going to look at it as a document. So it's all very well and good sort of going off and doing this searching. Um, but um, yeah, you need to know what it is that you're looking for in, inside a document and where you need to look and how to do that efficiently. Um, so the different types of searching, as I said, we're going to look at the different types, uh, delve into those in a bit of detail. Um, to see how you would do each of the searches and what types of techniques you might use for those. And then I'm going to hand over to Dan. He's going to look at some techniques that you can use, the, the actual tools that you need to delve into the database to, to extract the documents that you need um, for whatever the purpose may be. Dan's going to give you a, a quick overview of the different types of search engines. So um, there are professional ones and there are publicly available ones. Um, so we're going to have a quick look at those and give you a bit of guidance as to which ones you might want to use, which you'll find the most effective. And then we've got this case study uh, where Jack's going to do a live search for us and we can see some of these techniques applied um, in, in real time um, and just see see what comes of it and see what, see what results you can find. Uh, we will do questions at the end, um, if that's okay. The questions, if you can use the chat function, um, that would be great. 
um, and then we'll pick them up at the end and we'll, we'll, we'll hand the questions out to the person that's best to answer those. Um, if there aren't any questions, that's absolutely fine. Uh, you can feed back to us later on um, and, and give us um, both feedback and, and questions if you want some further guidance or information. That's absolutely fine. You've got our contact details, so we're more than happy to do that uh, after the event. That's okay. Okay, so what is patent searching? Um, I'd say it, the, the, the patent database is the largest collection of human knowledge. Um, there are over 120 million published patent applications covering a whole range of technology um, going back to something like 1836, I think. Um, that's great. Uh, what, what, what a fantastic resource to have. But then also, how do you find that needle in that haystack? Um, there's so much information out there that if you don't know what you're doing, um, um, it's, it's going to be a fruitless task. You're going to spend a lot of time and effort and energy trying to find something um, to no avail. So what we're going to do today is, is show you some tools and tips and tricks to, to allow you to get into that corpus of documents and, and uh, find a way forward in an efficient and, and timely manner. Um, so we've, we've got this, this big um, load of information. How can you use that? There are lots of different uses. Um, most, I would say, are probably underutilized um, to say the, the sort of resource that you've got in your hands there. So to run through, we're going to run through each of these in detail, but competitor analysis. So it's a great tool to see what your competitors are doing and the different reasons why you might want to look at your competitors. Um, you can look at different target technologies. So if you're looking at going into a particular area or you want to see who's active in that area, um, then um, it's, it's, it's a great tool to do that. Patent landscaping, um, I've used that term there. That, that's a kind of generic catch-all term to cover what you might refer to as pan, uh, patent analytics. So if we're looking into, a, in, in, into the databases to find out various metrics, um, data, statistics, whatever it might be, um, then we can do that. Um, and you can also get some very nice visual representations out of uh, the data that you find. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as a, as a thing that you can do later. Um, and then there's the more sort of professional searches. So um, the three at the bottom there. So if we are looking to file a patent application, you might want to do a patentability search before you invest in um, paying an attorney to, to draft and file a patent application, for example, or just to see what sort of space you might get before you embark on that, that, that journey. We might do validity searches. So if we come across a patent that's um, in place and is potentially being a roadblock, then we can um, try and knock that patent out or at least reduce the scope so it's less of an issue. So we can go ahead and do some searching specifically to find prior art against a granted patent, which is which is sounds similar to a patentability search, but it is actually different and it's carried out in a different different way. And then we can look for third party rights. So are there any issues there in the first place? And um, so it, uh, do we have freedom to operate? So I say we'll go through each one of those um, shortly um, and give you a bit more of a flavor as to what those are in a bit more detail and, and how you might use those. Before we get to that, so what is a patent? What are we talking about here? So I think most of you probably know that um, a patent's a legally granted right, which provides a monopoly for a technical invention. So we apply to a government and we go through an examination process where they look at the different types of prior art. Is your inventive, invention sufficiently novel and inventive within the meaning of the law? If it is, then you get this, this monopoly right for that invention as it's defined in the claims. Um, the document itself, though, um, is a lot more than that. It uh, includes bibliographic information, uh, an introduction to the technology, uh, a detailed description, uh, including some drawings, and then the claims, which I've just mentioned, which is what actually defines the protection. Um, I'll run through those in a bit more detail each now. These are important because they give you the, um, the information that you need to, to understand what's in the document, how to refer to the document, um, who, who has um, applied for the documents, so the, 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 the person that owns it, the inventors, um, and, and understanding the sort of makeup of the document allows you to efficiently look um, for and at the information that you need um, when, you're, when you're carrying out searches. So um, this is a front page of a an older European patent application. Um, there's lots of data on there. I've highlighted in the first instance 
the uh, numbers, um, the application number, which is on the bottom left, and the publication number. So the application number is the one that we normally, as attorneys, we refer to um, when we're referring to a matter, um, and that's the, the number one identifier. Um, that gets uh, put onto the patent when it's first filed. Um, so when we file something, we'll give you the filing date and the application number. The publication number is the one at the top right that gets assigned when the application publishes. So patent applications publish after 18 months from the initial filing date. Um, and then they get this, this uh, seven digit code at the top. Um, there's a two country code identifier, um, which is EP in this case, so that's a European patent, but each code has the normal, um, the normal uh, two country code identifier. And then we've got at the end an A1. So in this instance, the A means that it's a published application. If it had granted and there were some granted rights in place, then it would be a B. Um, and then the, there are variants on this, so you, you can get A1, A2, A3, uh, but they're all published applications. And then you get B1, B12, and sometimes C, so they're, they're different variants. But um, if it's a B, then it's granted. If it's an application, then it's just an A. Um, and obviously, if it's granted, then it can be enforced against you. If it's an application, then it's still a moving target. Um, and um, it just has a different connotation about it. So there are lots of dates on the on the bibliographic data uh, on the front page. Um, those all have different meanings. Um, it can get very confused as to what they are um, and what they mean. Significantly, um, the priority date, which is the one on the bottom, uh, that is the date that's given when you first file your first application um, for an invention. So ordinarily, um, Marks and Clark would file a UK patent application. It would be given that priority date. Everything that occurs before the priority date is prior art. Everything that occurs after that prior priority date is um, not prior art for that particular invention. So we would normally advocate to file quite early on so that the priority date is as early as possible. Um, and then the, the amount of prior art out there is inevitably smaller because you filed as soon as you possibly can. The longer you leave it, the later the priority date, the more prior art there's going to be out there. In terms of searching, um, the date that's possibly more important is the publication date. So as I, I think I said earlier, um, patents publish after 18 months. So the publication date is the one on the top there with the number two next to it. That's the date when this piece of information becomes publicly available to the world. And then that's when it counts as prior art for um, the, the assessment of inventive step and novelty um, when we're examining a patent application. So if the publication date precedes the priority date, then uh, that's when you need to worry about it. In terms of you searching for stuff, then it's a little bit academic because if it's published, um, you'll find it. If it's not published, it won't have a publication date and it's, it's not going to appear on your radar. So um, it's, it's a, bit, uh, a bit of an academic point, perhaps. Uh, the date of filing, just to close that off, that is the date when this particular application was filed and that's the one that the term of the patent is judged by. So you get 20 years from that filing date, uh, provided that the fees are paid and that sort of thing. Okay, then we'll jump down to the abstract and the title. So the title's at 54 there uh, and the abstract is at 57. So this is the first insight you get into actually what is this document about? Um, the title can often be enough if you're searching through a long list of documents. The first thing is the title. Is it remotely relevant? If it is, then you can drop into the, the, the abstract, uh, start having a look at that. Um, and then normally um, you get a, a figure with the a drawing with the, with the abstract. Um, I've cut that off the bottom of this one. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, and yeah, the, that, that is the quickest and easiest way into a document is to, is to title abstract and then the figure. And then a lot of searching is about being efficient in how you get into the different documents. If you've got a hundred or so documents to step through uh, as part of your search, then obviously the quicker you can get into those, the, the, the more efficient um, the search will be and the more effective it will be for you. One thing that we're gonna look at is the competitor analysis. So there are two things that reveal who your competitors are, who's filed this. One is the applicant, which is shown on the bottom left at 71. Um, so this is a, an application by Rolls-Royce PLC. Um, and then we've got the inventors on the right hand side. So you may just want to know who is, is filing an application. 
but it is often the case, and one of the other chaps will talk about this in a bit more detail later on, that the applicant name might not be who you think it is. It might not be um, the trading name that you're used to dealing with. It might be the, the group name or whatever it might be. Um, so another way to try and close off um, a particular applicant or a competitor would be to look at the inventors. So if you're aware of a particularly prolific inventor, then you can um, look into the inventor names and um, um, cross-reference with those. So um, in this instance, we can see that um, yeah, we've got four inventors. One of those is actually myself. I'm holding my hand up to that one on this one, and I'm also the representative as well, or was the representative for this when I was at when I was at Rolls Royce. So, um, there we go. Right, and then finally, we've got the international uh, technology classifications there. So we're going to come on to this in more detail later. This is one of the most useful tools that we can have, and probably the most underutilized when people are searching and this is largely because um, they're misunderstood they can come across as being very complicated um, but basically the, the the concept is that when the applications get given to the patent offices around the world they look at them and say right how do we classify this technology and they'll put it essentially into a bucket with similar technologies uh, attribute this code or the, the codes that you can see there to that particular technology and then when you're searching you can use these codes to um, find similar technology documents and the prior art that you you actually need that you're looking for um, so the the the, um, the lads Dan and Jack will, will speak more about how we can use those how those technological uh, technology classifications are, are, are used and, and um, what they actually mean in, in themselves. So into the document itself, just very briefly. So we've got um, on the, the turquoise um, top left hand side there, we've got the bibliographic information that we've just looked at and the figure there that I uh, mentioned, um, which is, is one of the easiest ways to, to sort of delve into a document. When you're looking inside a patent, so let's say you've gone along, you've done a bit of basic level search and you think, yeah, this is kind of relevant. Let's have a, a bit more of a look inside the document. Um, there is, you, you don't want to read the whole thing cover to cover. Again, it's, it's about efficiency, about getting into the, the document to see what's in there. So it's very personal um, as to what people look at. Some people look at the drawings and are happy just relying on those. Some people like to get into the text of it. The first thing within a patent application is the introduction. And that's often a place that I start. Um, an invention is a solution to a technical problem, almost by definition. And um, the, the problem is often laid out in the introduction. And if you can understand the problem, the place where they're coming from, um, then it's easy to understand what the invention is and, and put the whole thing in context. The other good thing about the introduction is that it's normally written in relatively comprehensible language. So um, without doing the profession of disservice, we do tend to overcomplicate things and uh, talk in very technical terms, uh, almost generic um, terms a lot of the time. And it's not language that inventors are typically um, used to coming across. So the introduction is good because often it, it sets the problem out in a more sort of um, layman's way. And um, so it's, it, it's easier to understand. Following that, we have the, um, the detailed description. So there is a section called the statements of invention or the summary of invention. I would wholeheartedly advise you to skip over that. That is normally a reflection of the claims and would be incomprehensible from a, from a, uh, a quick review. So I would say skip over the, the summary of invention, which is immediately after the introduction. Go into the detailed description, which is the boxes with in green. Um, that's by far the biggest part of the document. When we file an application, we have to describe it in enough detail that someone can come along and recreate the invention uh, from that document itself, just using background knowledge that's common within the within the technical field. Um, so the, the the green the the detailed description detailed description in the green boxes there gives you that further level of detail and explains exactly what the invention is. So we've done a search. We think it's relevant. The background's looking kind of relevant. Let's dig into the, the actual description. What is this document saying? What has it disclosed? Is it the same as what we're looking for? At the end, we've got the claims. So I don't personally use the claims that I'm searching. Some people do. They can give you a bit of an insight into the document 
and from a generic sense and um, claims are quite generic they're quite broad they're not very specific normally um, so it can give you a bit of a window into the document but again they're written for lawyers by lawyers um, and they are um, can be hard to get into unless you sit down and actually study them properly for an amount of time so normally I would advise that you don't use the claims. Um, Jack may say differently, he's a professional searcher so he may use the claims um, but he's used to that sort of language and how they're structured and, and, and um, what they um, what they mean. Um, so um, yeah from a lay point I think I would probably avoid them. So the claims um, just to look at those in a little bit more detail because it is relevant for the types of searching that we're going to be explaining in a second. Um, so as I say, they define the, the legal protection that's sought. It is a bunch of, uh, or a list of features. Um, so if you have um, one additional feature in your claim that isn't in the prior art, then um, it's a novel claim. So in this instance, um, we've got at the very bottom there of claim one, where in the power transfer configuration, in the power transfer configuration, the magnetic flux guides of the inner and outer cores abut one another. So when I drafted this, I imagine the prior art was something where the uh, there was an inner and outer core, and they didn't touch one another, they didn't abut each other. So by saying that they do abut each other, um, we have a novel claim, and then we have to argue whether that that's inventive. On the flip side, if you have a product and it fits within that claim and it infringes that claim, then your product has every integer within that claim. If you don't have one of the integers within that claim, one of the features, then you don't infringe that claim. Okay, um, so that's that's um, novelty and uh, uh, infringement um, in a nutshell. Okay, we don't advise that people look at infringement this is just to give you a bit of a backdrop um, because the claims in, from an infringement point of view have to be looked at in detail they have to be interpreted in light of the description um, and there's equivalence to those features in there as well so it's not a straightforward matter so but this is just to give you a bit of a backdrop as to what it is we're looking for within the claims and um, for novelty and um, for potential infringement so that's that's a pattern in itself as a document um, so hopefully that was that was useful it just sets the scene and, and gives you an insight as to how you can sort of get into that document efficiency uh, efficiently and, and, and how you can find the information that you need so I mentioned earlier on that there are different types of searching um, the first one that we're going to cover off is competitor analysis so um, at least for the, the, the businesses that are online I appreciate that we've got a university as well but for the businesses that are online um, the biggest I suppose threat or the most relevant prior art that you're going to come across is from your competitors they're in the same technical field as you and they're going to be presumably filing on similar things to you um, and generally keeping an eye on your competitors is probably a healthy thing to do um, so you can I uh, say so there's, there's name searches there but we can search on so finding out about your competitors is relatively easy to do we can do it to see if they what sort of technologies they're looking at at the moment so let's say that they're developing uh, a new product they haven't got to launching that product yet so you've not seen it out there in the marketplace but um, it could be that they've been filing patent applications on that technology in the background prior to launching so there is this 18 month window where uh, you can't see what's been filed and um, there is a delay but nonetheless I think it's probably worth keeping an eye on competitors just to see what they're up to um, you can do it yourself or we can set up watches where we can see when things get published um, so that you can see if there's a new application being filed uh, when that publishes as it progresses through examination and just keep half an eye on what your competitors are doing this can be good for prior art so um, so they're in the same techno sphere as you this is the same sort of passage and, and path that you're on um, and so they are likely to be coming up with prior art and um, so if you're looking to file an application a quick look at your competitors might tell you um, if there's prior art in this area that you need to worry about it might tell you um, if there's patents that need to be avoided so there's normally patents out there that that will read onto your business in some way shape or form um, a lot of those if they do become an issue you can buy your way out of trouble you can take a license for example but if they're a number one competitor then that might not be so easy you might not have that get out of jail card um, in which case you may be facing changing your technology um, or taking some other action to avoid a competitor patent if you know about that up front 
um, and and you can meet it headlong without the pressure of um, a, an imminent lawsuit or some nasty uh, sort of conversations and pleasant conversations, then so much the better. So my personal view on competitor patents and, and, and that side of things is to um, be aware of it before it happens, before it comes an issue, and then you can do something about it in your own time um, and uh, in, in the way that you see fit. Uh, the other thing that you might want to do is if you see that your competitor is going for a patent, then we can look to disrupt that process. So um, maybe they're going for some, um, some space that you want to be in or that you are in um, and you're worried about the, an application going through. Maybe you just want to frustrate your client. Uh, sorry, your competitor, not your client. Um, your competitor, uh, a great way to do that is to file observations, is to is to approach the patent office and say, um, we don't think the patent should be granted because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and we can we can do that. That's something we do reasonably uh, regularly. Um, and it can be um, quite a useful tool um, to remove issues before they occur. How do we do this type of searching? Names, obviously, um, if you're looking for a competitor, um, I think Jack's going to talk a bit more about uh, names, of, possibly Dan actually, sorry, um, about names and things you need to be aware of when you're searching for names and some subtleties there. But names obviously is, is the key one when you're targeting a specific competitor. And then we can also shoulder the things in there. So we look at keywords, so the words that uh, appear within a, a, a patent, um, the technology classifications and possibly geographic limitations if we're just interested in, in the UK, for example, um, or a, a UK part of the business and, and the rights that exist within the UK, um, then we might want to limit uh, the search geographically. Uh, okay, targeting different technologies of interest. So um, obviously we've got a tool in the fact that we've got uh, these technology classifications which allow us to look at buckets of technology relatively easily. Um, the size of the, the classifications, um, or the, the sort of graduated down, so you can go to quite a fine level of detail, but we can grab a whole load of technology um, classifications and look at a pool of technology. Um, you might want to do this if it's a, an avenue that you're looking to go into, if you just want to get an overview of, of the IP that's in a particular technological space, um, so that the sort of state of the art in a given sector. Um, what some people do, which I think is quite useful, is to identify a technology partner or a supplier. So let's say you're developing a product um, and you want to find somebody that can provide you with a widget to bolt onto your product or, or do a bit of development work for you, then uh, looking into the patent database gives you another avenue into it, in, 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 into this, uh, particularly if it's a, an area of technology that you're not used to. So obviously you can do a Google search and have a ask around of your contacts. Um, but this 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 can, um, looking at the different types of technology uh, through the patent database can be quite useful, um, or it has proved to be in the past. Um, another thing that it can prove useful for is if you are looking at a particular supplier of a technology, do they have the IP for that technology? Um, they may not have, um, it might be that you're going to go and buy something and then cheerfully walk your way into an infringement issue potentially. Or let's say you've got two or three different technology partners lined up, uh, who you're going to talk to, which one holds the better IP position? Um, who's more more of a savvy player who, who has filed applications, who's protected their IP? Um, so again, it's, it, it's another thing that we can do to, to give you a bit of assurance and a bit more of a, an open mind when going into these um, these relationships with people. So again, we can use the, the types of different searches, the technology classifications, certainly keywords again, so just generic searching um, for a particular type of technology, geographical limitations. So if we're looking for UK companies, we'd assume that they have filed for IP within in the UK, so we could limit searches to make it more manageable that way. And then obviously names, if we're familiar with, with particular names, we can, we can search on that basis. So pattern analytics, I mentioned this earlier on, um, it, it's a bit of a, a, a nebulous term. It, it can cover just about anything. I mean, it, in essence, what pattern analytics is, is getting a big bucket of stuff and then mining it for data. Um, so most of the commercial tools come with some sort of analytics um, uh, capability um, where we can feed loads of data into it and pull out any results that we want to, um, which might be useful to your business and your understanding of, of the IP. Um, so it can be things from just 
putting in basic watches in place. Um, so as I mentioned before, if, if you wanted to keep an eye on a competitor, we can put a place a, a watch in place, or you can put a, a watch in place um, to um, uh, just keep a, a, a track of what they're doing. Or we can we can get a whole load of technology, dive into it, pull out filing statistics. Where are people filing? Who's filing? Uh, what actual technology are they filing on? Um, uh, in terms of specific inventions or in terms of just generic areas of technology. Um, and then there's, there's any number of different ways of presenting this information. So uh, graphically, um, you can, you can uh, display the results how you want. Um, this is, tends to be a bit more in terms of the data mining and, and, and pulling out all this holistic information, it tends to be a bit more of a professional service just because it's so labor intensive so i know at least one person on the call today has gone through the process of trying to um, do some pattern analytics and, and and getting a sort of pattern landscape put together um, and i think they've experienced what i've experienced in the past is is just the amount of time and effort it takes to take this big pool of data and turn it into some useful information um, so it's quite often easier to pass that to a professional um, and we've got some capability in-house that we can do through the guys but um, we can certainly put you in touch with other companies that specialize in this sort of thing um, and, and give you sort of proper um, pattern analytics that you can use for, for commercial purposes okay next is a novelty search so now we're into the more sort of professional side of things um, a novelty search or patentability search as i think i called it earlier on this is the the pre-filing search and this is a means for you to firstly save yourself some money really um, you can have a look around we have an invention we're thinking about applying for a patent for it um, what else is out there what's going to get in our way to um, stop us getting that patent granted and through the system and um, if you can do that efficiently in-house with your own people that would hopefully save you time and money um, and a part of what we're going to do today and part of what Jack's going to do or the search that Jack's going to do is a, is a novelty search to try and find that piece of prior art which would say right it is worth going for it isn't worth going for doing this type of search is um, about spending some time efficiently sort of uh, looking into this huge corpus of, of documents to try and find something that's similar to what you're trying to do it isn't about finding a killer piece of prior art it isn't about doing it to death it's maybe an hour um, possibly two at tops having an efficient way of searching um, and so we're going to give you the tools that you need to do that efficiently um, to put it in context patent examiners at the patent offices have um, a day to two days to search and examine an application they have professional tools they've got lots of experience normally um, and so the job that they're going to do is very different to the one that you're trying to do you're just trying to find any outliers out there any sort of high points that you can use to guide your your thoughts and your feeling uh, on, on whether to progress with a, with a patent application it also makes the attorney's job easier because if we've got something to draft against, um, then we can formulate the claims a lot uh, more readily. So uh, when we looked at that claim briefly before, I pulled out the feature at the bottom. If I've got a piece of prior art, which has got all of the other features in, and I just need to identify that one feature at the bottom, it makes my job a lot easier. And it makes the claim that comes out of the process a lot more effective um, for doing the job. So having that closest piece of prior art, as we refer to it, is, is is useful to have no two ways about it uh, again we can do these searches for you um, but um, the purpose of this talk is to enable you guys to do it yourself uh, rather than having to, to sort of spend that additional uh, bit of money with us um, and it's typically that type of searching is something we'd, we'd outsource anyway um, and get a professional search firm to do and um, to, to, to do it justice um, it also so um, if, if you're looking into the, the prior art you may come across granted uh, patents or, or, or applications which you think could be relevant to your commercial undertaking in, in, in that area with regards to that invention and as I said before that is just better to know about upfront so you can do something about it whilst things are fluid whilst you can still change the engineering um, to, to try and avoid those potential blockers uh, again we're using keywords technology classifications um, and no jurisdictional limitation on those so um, prior art 
once it publishes with uh, regards to a patent application, that's prior art around the world, wherever it was published um, and in whatever language it was published. Um, so we can't just restrict to UK patents and think, oh, we're okay. Um, there's no local novelty, it's, it's a global novelty. And then freedom to operate. So this is a tricky one uh, because it does require um, a specialist knowledge of patents, of patent searching, um, and it's not something that we would advocate that you do um, off your own back. Um, it requires looking at the claims of the patent itself to see what they actually cover, um, it, uh, which, which inevitably requires a thorough understanding of what patent claims are. Um, there are other considerations such as status, um, is the thing in force, where is it in force, is there anything that you've not seen? So let's say you look at um, a family of, of patents and you don't see a UK one there, but is there an EP one that might cover the UK and that type of thing? Um, so it, it requires a specialist search and it requires a an attorney to look at those results of those searches to advise properly on whether you have got freedom to operate. That said, um, there is no harm if you don't want to commit to that sort of level of spending um, because it, it isn't um, that cheap to, to have that level of work carried out. If you wanted to do a, a quick sanity check and just find these high points and reduce the risk that you think you're facing, um, then there, the, there's no harm in you having a look yourself um, and trying to find these high spots. Um, but just bear in mind that that, that isn't comprehensive um, and we do strongly advise that if you want true freedom to operate and to really reduce the risk of running into something further downstream that it is done um, um, professionally. Um, when to do this? So um, that's often a question we face. So some people, um, companies, whatever, um, they want to um, have some assurance before they embark on spending money on developing a project um, or a product. That typically is very difficult to do because you don't know what the product is and you don't know what it is you're looking for in the claims. So when I was talking again earlier on about uh, the, the structure of the claims and we had that feature at the end. We need to know which features we're spe specifically which features we're looking for in those claims to enable us to say um, whether you've got freedom to operate. If those features don't exist, if the product hasn't been developed yet, then we can't look for that. Um, so it's finding the balance between when are we going to launch this product, um, when's it it stabilized enough when when's the, the solution defined well enough for us to be able to go and look in the patent databases um, to, to find what it is we're looking for but then equally when's the point of no return if we um, so say so let's say you, you, you've spent so much on developing it to a particular TRL at the technology readiness level um, then you need to commit to tooling or, or um, take some other sort of next step in in uh, outlay for developing the product then it, it's probably that point that you can't return easily from from that 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 point that you need to get this searching done rather than leaving it until later on um, okay so um, the type of searching that that you would do there again is t uh, keywords technology technology classifications and jurisdiction so patents are jurisdiction specific um, and they um, uh, so, so if you were only active in the UK, you would only need to look for UK patents. You don't really need to worry about what's in the US or wherever it might be. So um, we can restrict by uh, jurisdiction. One thing I've, I've omitted to put on there is also names. So um, we can go and look at the whole world's uh, IP um, and see what's out there, or we can just restrict to competitors. Um, as mentioned before, that competitors um, uh, they're going to be the sticking point, they're going to be the ones that you can't get past easily. So you might decide to restrict your search to um, just your main competitors and find these really high pressure points. And then invalidity, just very quickly, um, I've just noticed the time, it's ticking on uh, quite rapidly. So invalidity is, again, a, it's a specific type of search. It is one that's done by professionals um, and these come about when um, you um, uh, need to get rid of a patent that's in your way. Um, so, yeah, I think on that one, uh, I've just seen Dan pop up, so I will leave it at that. I will pass the, uh, the presentation over to Dan, if you just bear with me for two seconds. I shall speak to you all shortly. Um, sorry. 
There we go. All right. All right. Dan, the presenter. And then that should pass over to Dan, hopefully. There we go. Fantastic. Okay. So thanks, Andy. Um, so Andy's talked through the, the what and the why. And this section is now more about the how, so the nuts and bolts of how to actually get it done. Um, if you haven't gathered already, it's not always as simple as you may expect. And whilst I'm sure all of you are very familiar with Google and a lot of the techniques are similar, it's just not as simple as Google, sadly. So, how to do it. Now, there's a couple of different techniques. Um, and what you'll eventually find is that you use blends of all of these. Um, and Andy's hinted on these already. So keywords are exactly what they sound like. Classifications, um, I'll go on and explain a bit more. And I realise there are two questions as well, and I'll answer both of those questions when I get to that section. Um, and there's a couple of other things, such as citations, names, dates, and countries and regions. And you can use all of these as limitations for how to narrow down your well, hundreds of millions of patents down to a, a manageable number that you can actually look through yourself and hopefully gain some useful information from. Um, typically, if you're doing novelty patentability searching, which is things that you guys can do yourselves, um, keywords and classifications are where to start. And you may not even need to go any further than that. Um, if you're doing things like competitor watching, you may be more focused on who and when. So the names and the dates. And um, you may look at particular classifications because then you can cover large areas of technology or very narrow areas of technology at the same time. So keywords, unfortunately, it's an art, not a science. And I want you to imagine now, <clears throat> I want you to imagine now that we're dealing with an invention for a spade handle. So the reason this is an art form and not a science is because what is the difference practically between a spade and a shovel? Now, if the patent application was written only discussing shovels and you search for spades, you're not going to find it. So the most important part is to get a list of synonyms and you can do this right off the bat. This should be the first step in any search. Um, and you should go a little step further than just spades and shovels and you should start considering what else could use your invention, for example. This is particularly valuable when you're doing things like novelty and patentability searching. So a garden trowel or a bricklayer's trowel are clearly different, but they may use something related to your product. And then you may have a garden fork entirely, which is different. Um, related but different and you can search for spade shovel trowel fork all of these terms and um, just to try and find a relevant piece of uh, a relevant document or piece of prior art that's just english of course so synonyms aren't restricted to english um, i do believe either next year or the year after it's predicted that china will file the most um, international patent applications across the world so um, you're going to find over the next five to 10 years an absolute proliferation of Chinese language documents. Now, I'm not expecting you uh, to be able to search in Chinese, but it's just a thought that actually it's worth considering where you're going to be looking and what languages you should look in. Um, practically, pragmatically, you're going to be doing these searches in English, which fortunately for all of us is the international business language. Um, so synonyms are critical. Also, alternative spellings are something you need to consider. So Americanisms is a classic example. Um, they can't spell aluminium. But also typos are worth considering. Um, a lot of the older patent documents um, are OCR scanned in order to get them into the databases. And you may find that certain letters don't work out. So as well as looking for spade, maybe you should be looking for five paid, for example. Um, and the way to get around that in an effect is to take a step away from nouns and start looking at what your object or your tool or your process is doing. So in this case, for example, we're looking at digging, um, but you can use other words that you might expect to find in those documents, such as entrenching or scooping, for example. Um, and what you find now is that you end up with a list of keywords that you may want to use in your searches that may be a dozen long, two dozen or so. Um, and that's a sensible way of going about it. And you'd end up doing lots of multiple searches and using these terms in various combinations with each other in order to get where you need to be. So what is good for us is that many of the databases and many of the search engines we use support Boolean searching. So and or not and if, and also truncation and wildcards. So if you're not familiar with that, 
Um, it's a symbol you can put in. It's often um, a hash symbol or the star symbol. And it means you can just ignore a letter. So you can do D star G and that will search for any letter in between D and G. So the problem with that is that you may search, uh, or if you do that search, you may find words such as dog, which is clearly not relevant. Um, but it does mean that you can cover dig and dug at the same time. Similarly, uh, for a truncation, you can do dig star and you'll find dig, digger and digging, but you'll also find digital which is obviously going to be quite different to your bent lumps of metal that we're looking at at the moment. Now, these last two are database specific. Fortunately, the ones I'm going to show you, or we're going to show you in a moment, do both support this. Um, so I think this is the second grade up. If you get used to keyword searching with synonyms, the next step to get better at it is to start using these search operators a bit more smartly. Um, right, classifications. This is your way of going another level above. And as Andy mentioned, it's often underutilized. So the classifications are the patent office's internal way of um, assigning the patent applications to particular departments. So it's nothing that we do. It's nothing that you guys as the inventors do. This is all down to the patent office. Um, and the question here is what's better to have one with lots of classifications or only one? It makes no difference whatsoever. Um, this is merely just how the Patent Office have decided to divvy up the work between them. Um, and you can see here that this application, it's the same application Andy showed us earlier, has four separate classifications. And what that means is that this particular piece of technology bridges certain fields. And you'll find that most probably have two or three. Um, when you're searching classifications, there's, there's two ways to go about it. Um, the one I, I advise to you is to start off with your keyword search, find a document that looks similar, and then you use that document as your seed document. So you can lift the classifications from that document and use those to filter your search. Um, in this case, H, um, that category relates to um, electricity and electronics. So what we can do if we know that we're searching for a spade still, we know it's not going to be electronics, so we can say not anything in category H, for example. Um, and what you end up finding with these classifications, um, the first letter is the, the main group, and then they come down into subcategories. And there are hundreds, if not thousands, of different categories. And you end up playing a game of animal, mineral, vegetable, um, or 20 questions, as you may also know it, and end up with something very, very specific at the end. But you don't have to search by the very specific category. You can just take the broad category, say H or H01, um, if you want to restrict yourself to a large area, for example. Um, and this is roughly what it looks like. These are the different categories. This is an international system. So this is, comes from the um, European Patent Office website, um, but the US Patent Office do the same thing. Um, and for the, uh, the document I just showed you, it's in category H. So if you click on H, you end up looking down here. Um, and H01, and H01, I believe it was F relates to magnets. And at this point, we're not even all the way at um, H01, F38 or 18. And these go all the way down. So there's lots of these. So you don't need to know these. Um, you can either, uh, or Jack will show you how to effectively search through the classifications, or um, what I quite like doing is using your seed document. Um, now, citation searching isn't something you do on its own. This is a way of making um, the patent office um, search reports work for you. So as Andy mentioned, when an application is filed, uh, the first thing they do is search it. And that gets published as a search report. And that search report lists the documents that the examiner thinks are similar. So if you've found a document that you think is relevant to what you want, you might as well have a look at what the Patent Office, with all of their years of expertise and powerful search tools, also thinks are relevant. And that means you've gone from finding one similar document to maybe half a dozen. Um, and each of those, again, will have their own citations. So you end up playing a game of six degrees of separation. You build a spider web of documents which are all relevant and relative to the technology you're searching for. Um, and here we've mentioned forwards and backwards citations or cited documents and citing documents. And that's just means um, when you file your application, anything that the Patent Office thinks is relevant is considered a cited document. And then later on, any later filed applications, if they uh, cite the one we started with, 
um, that can be linked to it as well. So it's a really useful way of going backwards and forwards through time. Um, searching by names is also possible. And usually what you're searching for is the applicant, so the owner of the patent application usually, or the inventor. And it sounds exactly, or it is exactly what it sounds like, but what you need to be really aware of is complex ownership structures of businesses. Most patents, most applications are owned by companies, not people. So you can own them yourself, but these are business tools and they're almost always owned by businesses. Um, and what that means is that the person or the legal person owning the right may not be who you think it is. To give you a tangible example, um, our trademark here, the Marks and Clark logo in the top right hand corner is owned by Marks and Clark Properties Limited. Whereas I'm employed by Marks and Clark LLP, so the partnership. And whilst these are uh, related and joined companies, they're not the same entity. Um, and there's no real reason for the names to be so similar. So if you search for Marks and Clark and actually it was owned by M and C, you wouldn't find it. Now, what that means is that you need to go beyond the patent databases and look at things like Companies House to try and find some names that are useful. And that also the great thing about that is they have a list of directors and it's not uncommon, especially with um, smaller businesses for the patent rights or the trademarks or the IP in general to be owned by the directors of that company. And then that can be licensed back to the company or just um, used, so I guess, unofficially to an extent. And then lastly, it may not even relate to that company at all. It may be technology that they have licensed in from elsewhere. Um, and just because their website says this is patented technology doesn't mean they own the patents. So if you search for that company name, you might not find anything. So what that means basically is that name searching isn't the be all and end all, but it can get you most of the way um, to what you need to know. So it's a good way of uh, monitoring competitors, but it's not everything. Um, so that's the different things we can put into these databases. So keywords, classifications, citation searching and names. You can also limit by date ranges um, and also by countries or country ranges. But really what I've not said yet and is the most important part is persistence. You're not gonna find this with your first search. Um, what you need to do is do your first search, update your search terms, do another search, see what you get, uh, keep adding terms until you get down to a manageable number and then take a new tack and keep going. So now the databases and search engines that you guys can use are the same as the ones we use. So I use Espasnet every single day. It's brilliant. Um, it's made by the EPO. Uh, that's the European Patent Office. It's free to use. It's really powerful um, and it has loads and loads of data in it. There's also um, Google Patents, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. And that's up until a couple of years ago was restricted to the US only. Now it is um, far broader than that. They keep adding information to that every day. Um, and that is a really, really good um, search engine to go through patent documents. Now there are professional databases. So what you're paying for when you um, order a professional search is their access to these other databases, which you have to pay for and can be very expensive. And what makes these better, if you can say that, is that the um, search tools that they have are more powerful um, and are smarter than those that you can get through the, um, the free to use databases. You also find that some of their data can be slightly more complete um, because they put more effort into making sure that any um, empty fields are completed, especially for the older documents. You find that Espasnet is maybe just a title and then a scan of the pages. You may not have a proper digitized copy, whereas certainly some professional databases put a bit of effort into making that. Um, so here we've done a, a very brief search for a spade handle in Google Patents. Um, no prizes for guessing the URL, that's patents.google.com. Um, it, it looks exactly like your regular Google search until you've carried out your first search. Um, so your keywords go in the top up here. And then down the left hand side, you have all of these different boxes where you can put in additional terms to limit your search by. So this search has turned out 120,000 results. So there's no way we're gonna go through all of that. So we can put in extra terms here. You can use or searching or and searching. You can limit by date and then by names as well. And then patent offices and languages at the bottom here until you get a number that's a bit more usable. Um, I'm not gonna go into any more detail on that because uh, Jack's gonna cover a lot of this um, with regard to a SPASnet. 
So to give a little bit of context for the live search that Jack's just about to do, um, you've probably seen these before. These are lock cylinders, and these will be in your front door, depending on the door you have. These are really, really common. Um, so this is known as a Euro profile lock cylinder, but this has a weakness, and this weakness is this central region here. Um, if you've ever changed the locks in your doors, you know that all you need to do is stick a screw or a bolt through here to fix it in place. And it also means that that region is weak and can be snapped by attackers. Um, and that has caused a, a rise in burglary. So this was back in 2012. Um, and it's something um, that lock manufacturers are aware of. So they came up with a solution um, or many solutions, which look a bit like this. And so these lock cylinders, um, they snap preferentially at this line here. So what that means is that when it snaps, and it will quite happily, this part of the lock is retained in the door. Um, so the attacker can no longer get into your door and then flick this part. Um, and this part in the middle is what um, uh, drives all the locks in the rest of the door. So the problem with this is that these new locks are very expensive, difficult to manufacture, um, and we're always looking for ways to optimize the system. So for example, we're gonna carry out a patentability search now, or in a second. Um, and if we had it snap here, what about if we put a spring-loaded mechanism in this part of the lock, which um, when this snaps, immobilizes this and that means you can't unlock any of the door and um, that's our concept so can we protect that concept that's what jack's going to be searching for in a moment and i'm just going to pass over the controls um, there's one question sorry that i've missed um, relating to ipc or cpc so that's your technology classifications doesn't make a difference um, they're basically the same thing um, at least uh, at the high level that you and i are going to be searching with they're identical um, CPC goes into slightly more detail at a granular level, but it doesn't really matter so much. Um, so the, the codes will be the same. Um, hopefully that covers all of those. Uh, so I'm just going to pass over to Jack now. Hopefully you can now see my screen. Cool. I've got the thumbs up from Dan, so that's good. Right, I'll just go back to my page here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, a SPASnet now. So um, what we've got is um, a free-to-use pattern family database. Um, one second. Uh, published by the European Patent Office. Um, it contains over 120 million um, patents published from 1836 to today. It contains information on published patent applications and granted patents from over 90 patent granting authorities. Uh, it's a user-friendly interface and is searchable in the major European um, patent languages, so English, French, and German. So there's plenty of searches you can run on here. So we've got smart search, we've got an advanced search, and we've got a classification search. Um, you can run a simple search by entering a single search term or mix of search terms in the search box at the top here. So let's follow on from uh, from Dan's example there. So um, bear with me if we come up, come across any um, any breaks or it sometimes can be quite slow to load. So um, let's search for cylinder lock in here and click on the um, click on the search button. Yeah, it's taking a bit longer than I expected. Jack, I'm just wondering, do you want to switch your webcam off and that might give you a bit more bandwidth? Your, your pitch is breaking up. Okay, that's cool. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, so that's found um, a large number of results based on the um, the keyword search. Um, so what we can do from there is, yeah, so you can see we've got eight eight hundred forty nine thousand five hundred forty two results, um, all relating to cylinder locks. Um, so obviously, you know, like um, 
like Dan said, we want to we want to do an efficient search. So if you click on the title of the um, of the uh, patent or application, that should open the Spassnet record. So as before, so the, the record contains bibliographic data, which Andy spoke about. So we've got information on inventors and applicants. And we've also got information on uh, dates and numbers for the priority, the filing and the publication, um, as well as IPC and CPC classifications, um, which will come in useful when I do a short CPC search later on. And there's also a link to the uh, official IPO register and a representative drawing as well here. Uh, the tabs above this sort of bibliographic data show that we have links to the description uh, and claims. Um, so if you want to get to uh, the key points in the in the document, you can do. Um, got the claims down here and the drawings, which can also be magnified to show more detail. If you click on the pop-up box opens. So we've got the original document, which also gives you the option in there to flip between the description and claims as well. Uh, we've got the forward and backward citations. Uh, yeah, so the, the backward citations, as Dan mentioned, are documents cited within this patent document. And we've also got forward uh, citations, which are subsequent documents uh, that cite this patent document. Um, We've also got simple family and Impadoc family um, options uh, available, which links to the equivalent documents um, as well as Impadoc legal status and events. Um, something that I find really useful if I'm looking at um, a non-English uh, document, for example, it might be a, a French application. I can see if there's any equivalent English um, document if English language documents available. So it might be that there's an Amer uh, a US or a GB application that I can look at and to see um, to see if there's any, uh, to see what the application is about basically. But we've got to be careful because it might have different claim language and that sort of thing. Um, also, there's a machine translation option there, which is normally quite reliable, but sometimes we have to be careful, particularly if we're translating a Chinese or a Japanese document. Um, there's also an option to download um, the original document, or we can share the link. Um, so we can copy it to the clipboard or send the link by email. So Dan mentioned the IPC um, the IPCs, so international patent classifications, which are used worldwide um, in every authority to classify patents. He also spoke about the CPC as well, so the cooperative patent classification um, to conduct searches. So the CPC is a sophisticated classification system um, developed jointly by the EPO and the uh, United States Patent and Trademark Office, uh, which defines specific aspects of an invention in great detail and actually in more detail than the IPC. So that's often used the CPC. Um, at the top level, the CPC is divided into these eight broad technology, technology sections and an in scheme um, for new technologies. So once we've clicked on the classification search tab, um, if you know a classification um, such as the one we found earlier for cylinder locks, um, which was EO5B17, you can either type it in here, the one that you know. So let's have a quick go at that. And what that'll do is um, that'll tell you um, the class that, it, that it's in um, and also the description of the of the CPC. So I can see the EO5B17 relates to accessories in connection with locks. So that's really useful um, when you so that when you are searching that CPC, you know what you're actually searching for. It gives you that description. Uh, I should mention here that although Dan kind of already touched on it, that classifications are formed of different levels. So you've got your section, which would be the E at the top. Um, you've got your class. 
uh, EO5, your subclass EO5B, uh, the main group EO5B17, and you've also got a subgroup below that. Alternatively, keywords can be used um, when searching for CPCs. So, for example, if I just replicate that smart, smart search that I did for cylinder locks within the classification search um, tab, it will bring me a list of um, a list of relevant CPCs that I can use. So we've got EO5B27 cylinder locks with tumbler pins, which are set by pushing the key in. And we've got down here EO5B17, which is accessories in connection with locks. So that's that just gives you the um, uh, the CPCs in order in order of relevance of what you've typed into your keyword search. If we want to do a classification search, a good place to start um, would be to use these tick boxes here. So, for example, if I tick on EO5, EO5B17, um, this uh, to the right of to the right of that list, um, this field will be populated here, which shows the selected classifications. Um, that will also include all of the subordinate classifications within EO5B17, so all of the children um, underneath that. Um, so once all of the required classifications have been selected, so we might want to click on EO5B27 as well, you'll see that it also populates the, the fields here. Um, if we click to find patterns there, it will generate an OR operator, which will be used to search in any of the classifications. Uh, for now, I'm just going to search EO5B17 and click on Find Patterns. So as you can see from there, we've got 15,390 results found. And you know, if you only have an hour to look at some uh, some potential prior art, you're not going to have time to look through all of those. So. Um, even though all the patents meeting that search criteria of just that one CPC um, will be displayed, um, it, it's probably beneficial to restrict the number of results with additional search terms. So these could be further classifications, keywords, or applicant names. So in order to search for further terms, you can click on the radio button for an advanced search. As you can see, the search interface has now changed to a tree structure that allows us for additional search terms to be added. So we can click on the plus field here. It creates an additional field. So if we can click on the down arrow next to the field name, CP, which is currently CPC, um, to see the drop down menu and the types of fields that can be searched. So it's quite detailed. So um, we've got text fields, names, dates, numbers, classifications, and other. Um, this also um, comes down to what you're what you're searching for. So, for example, uh, if you're looking at um, a company search, you'll want to look at names. Uh, if you're looking at a patentability search, it might just be um, technical subject matter. So, um, let's just play around with it. So, if we look at some names first of all, and we can can always go back and change the search afterwards. So, if you have a company in mind, let's choose uh, applicants. So this will find documents where you've got uh, an AND function with CPC and applicant. So we know, for example, Yale are a familiar lock manufacturer and they're owned by Asa Abloy. Um, so in order to keep the results where the applicant name has been shortened, let's search to just Asa. Um, because a lot of the time, um, the Abloy part of that name isn't mentioned within the um, bibliographic information. So let's see how that narrows down the search. Okay, so from there we've got 145 results found. Um, they're all going to be relevant to uh, accessories of locks uh, owned by owned by ASA. So let's try and narrow it down because you know you might find that 145 results is, is still a bit too many. So let's try uh, in this case a text field. Um, so title claims are abstract, so that means that uh, whatever your search term is going to be in here, let's try, um, I don't know, cylinder. 
Um, so that so these uh, search terms in combination will show um, any application owned by ASA uh, within the CPC um, here, where, where the term cylinder appears in the application, uh, sorry, the title abstract or claims. Further narrow that down. Okay, so that means we've got 48 results found. Um, let's try some. Let's try another term. So what Dan was talking about, anti-snap. Okay, there's no results for that. So that means we've probably narrowed it down a bit too a bit too far. Um, let's stick to the 48 results that Cylinder found in combination. You can also use um, terms such as spring or shear, like um, like Dan mentioned. Um, so we've got a list of 48 results there. I think that's probably enough to um, be able to to scroll down the page and look for relevant applications. Um, as with the smart search, you can you can click on the title again and look for um, and look through the bibliographic information, uh, the claims, the description, the drawings to see what, what you think is uh, relevant. Um, quite an important part of um, this is Spassnet, uh, search, which I think might be really relevant to you, is, is being able to store your preferred results. So you may wish to save a few of the results to review separately. Um, what you can do there if you decide, for example, that you like the look of um, of uh, number one, three, and five. Um, you can look at those at a later date or just store them for now. You might want to edit the, the search terms to look for new patterns um, and add those to your to your sort of um, a list of patterns. So what you can do is in the menu section here, add selection to my patterns. That stores those three um, documents in uh, this is my Spassnet tab. Underneath here, there should be a yeah, section for my patents, my queries, my settings. So within the my patent section, there's three results there. And then if you want to go back to your search, you can just go back to your results. And you can edit your search as well by clicking on the radio button again. So let's just try spring, for example. And maybe we want to take out the um, the narrowing function of, of having ASA in there because there might be other applicants that you're interested in that you, you might not even know about. We can play around with the search terms here. So yeah, that's quite a lot of results. Um, but yeah, again, you can go down and just keep adding patents to your to your list, and then find it in here. So in terms of support for your searches, if we go back to the front page, there's additional support that can be found at the bottom of the Espacenet search page, um, including pocket guides, uh, discussion forums, and FAQs. This is in addition to the support that we can provide you um, with our, with our in-house tools as, as well. Okay, so I'm gonna hand back over to Andy. Uh, there we go. Thanks, Jack. Just let me share my screen. Um, he says, where's that button gone? Is that on? Can you see the screen's been, uh, Jack or Dan, can you let me know if you can see my screen, please? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Thank you. Um, so thank you very much for that, uh, Dan and Jack. Um, hopefully that was useful for you. Um, we've had some questions in on the chat function, but I think those have been attended to along the way. Um, so, okay, so there is another one there. What was that one? Uh, what about patent scope? Is this considered to be a good and reliable database? Jack, are you familiar with uh, patent scope? Dan? Uh, yes, yeah, so that is yeah. one that I use on occasion. Um, historically, that was more of a register um, than a than a search engine, and so that had all of the international patent applications on it. 
Um, and that is still all I use it for now. Um, so I've just had a quick look at it now, and it does say it has 91 million patent documents. So it's not quite as comprehensive as Espasnet. Um, I'm not that familiar with um, the, the, how the search uh, tools function, um, but it, it's run by um, the World Intellectual Property Office. So it is a good, reliable database. Um, it's just not one that I use frequently myself. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, for my part, I, I use a mix of Spassnet and Google patents. I find Google um, is a lot more natural language searching. Um, and uh, once you get the results up for, for Google, if you scroll down to the bottom of the screen, you get a nice list of forward and backward citations, uh, which you can click on each of the links quite readily. And it also gives you similar to uh, citations as well. So. Um, it's a bit more user friendly, a bit easier to get into the stuff. As fast net, if you want to start structuring searches together, as, as Jack's just done, um, I think that's probably more useful for that as I found it. Um, when I've done searching in the past as part of my job, we've had a professional tool um, to, to use, and there is quite a distinct difference between the two um, and how they operate. But um, you can normally get some pretty good results from, from both of those uh, publicly available tools. Um, and it's just about playing around with them and, and seeing what you prefer. Um, the best um, in terms of actual searching strategy um, what I used to do personally was um, I would do a pretty coarse keyword search um, see what that brought up find just scoot through a, even if it's a long list scoot through the list quickly find something that's kind of relevant to what you're looking for dive into that you can take the the classifications from that document and use those and you can also use the forward and backward citations and actually just rely on the work that somebody else has done before so um, the patent office um, has done before um, and just kind of as, as Dan mentioned just spread out from that one document and just find the nearest one and keep grabbing the nearest one until you've got something that you're happy with um, it's not foolproof by any means but it's it's an easy way to, to get into things and try and find the, the hot spot or the highest spot that you, that you need to worry about for your quick cursory search just to just to scratch the itch um, as it were okay cool so um, I'm very conscious that we've totally overshot on time so I apologize for that um, we've kept most of the attendees I'm pleased to say so um, uh, obviously it's not been too boring unless everyone's fallen asleep I don't know um, just to do a, a quick summary um, so we went through why to search um, there are lots of different things you can do with the searching um, it is just a massive collection of data um, and if you can think of a reason or a way to use it then then hopefully we've given you some tools now where you can dive into that um, and and uh, sort of extract some information to allow you to make better informed decisions um, we are here to support you so if you want some professional searching doing or you have queries around searching or some you need some more assistance and please do um, get in touch that's absolutely fine um, we um, are doing this not as a sales pitch uh, at all we're doing it so we can better educate you so you become more familiar more familiar with IP and as I said earlier it does make our job easier if you can hand us prior art and say um, this is what we're dealing with this is what we need to try and find um, yeah and I, I think we've probably covered it there I mean it, it, it is a dark art um, and the, the thing I would say is it isn't absolute, it is about risk reduction. Um, it's about finding these high points and trying to knock those off, not trying to knock it out of the park and find absolutely everything. There will always be more prior art out there um, that will be found or, or may not be found. Um, but it's just about getting yourself into it and giving yourself a bit more information and trying to find these, these low hanging fruit to, to coin a phrase. Um, so you can um, progress from there and, and hopefully uh, get a bit of an insight into the world as to, to what's going on. Um, we've got another question there. Uh, is the presentation being recorded? Yes, it is. Um, provided Kieran presses the right button when we hang up, uh, that, should be, that should be saved. And then we will circulate this afterwards. We'll time mark the point where Jack's search starts. So you can actually see that in action and, and try and mimic that process as you're going along. Um, and I say we're always happy to, to have questions. So uh, hopefully that was useful. I don't know if uh, you two guys have got any sort of closing words or? No. There's a question directed to me, I think, about what okay. my favorite platform is. Um, my favorite free platform to use is uh, Espasnet. Um, it just flows so much easier than, than anything else. Uh, I've been using it for about five years now. Um, but we do have access to um, uh, a subscription service, um, Derwent Innovation, which has really good um, analytics tools as well. I normally use Espasnet to find my key CPCs. 
and then go over to Derwent to uh, to search on those. So normally a combination um, of things, but if it's just a, a quick and dirty search, I can look on as fastnet. Um, I definitely recommend a sort of layperson to do that as well. Good stuff, right? Thank you very much. Uh, we'll sign off at that, and uh, just thank you again for for coming along today. Uh, there is a trademark session, uh, I think, this time next week. Uh, so if you're more into marketing and branding and want a similar sort of content for for trademarks, and please do um, sign into that one and get in touch if you've not had the invite yet. Um, and this is the first of a series of um, sessions we'll be doing, um, and we'll circulate more more about those later. But it's just covering different aspects of IP and trying to sort of give more information to you guys to um to work to, to use in your uh, everyday life so thank you very much good to see you bye bye